Yeah, I think there's a um, the, there's a bias, and I think there's a narrative among a lot of today's journalists. And um, and as I mentioned before, during the Trump administration, I think it had already started, but I think it was during the Trump administration that there start, started to be a lot more analysis and editorializing actually included in straight news stories. Um, as I, you know, as I mentioned before, when I took journalism decades ago, uh, we were taught you don't, you don't, you don't write bias stories. You when you want to express an opinion, you don't do it yourself. You include a quote from someone who says, you know, the president was lying, uh, as opposed to that. And now, more and more, I think in the mainstream media, you're seeing articles, well, you'll, you'll see analysis that, that is called analysis. But a lot of the news stories are analytical, as opposed to letting the reader decide uh, make make decisions about you know the the whoever's being talked about or the situation that's being talked about and more and more it feels like uh, we're being spoon fed a certain point of view and that's not confined to the liberal media it's it's I think all of the media and certainly I'm. I'm dismayed by a lot of the cable news networks uh, on both sides of the of the you know political spectrum, in that they seem to focus on those stories that will get eyeballs, and there's a whole wide world beyond those stories that really is being ignored. And I'm concerned about people in the country, for instance, who will watch CNN or MSNBC or Fox News all day and think they're being informed. I think they're really not. It's, it's a very sort of skewed point of view, and it's very narrow. And I think there, there is this, this, the, this, this tendency, more than a tendency, among the media to have certain, certain points of view on what is good and what is bad. And for instance, liberal democracy, good. Authoritarianism, bad. And yeah, I think that works for, for, you know, populations that are well educated and, and countries that have strong indi- uh, institutions, a strong judiciary, an independent judiciary, a, you know, a functioning uh, tax revenue service. But uh, in a lot of the world, that doesn't exist. And in their countries, Somalia, for instance, where democracy lasted about a day when, when the dictator Siad Bari fell. And uh, liberal democracy is it's a wonderful ideal, but it doesn't work everywhere. And authoritarianism maybe isn't preferred, but it's way better than total anarchy. Anarchy doesn't work for anyone. And, and I think as, you know, the... the you know, the stories on places like Egypt. Mubarak, bad. Al-Sisi, bad, because they're authoritarian. But liberal democracy produced the Muslim Brotherhood. And the country was inherently more unstable and dangerous, and there were more crimes during a liberal democracy. And certainly from a U.S. foreign policy perspective, uh, I think it is more beneficial to U.S. interests to have someone like al-Sisi as the president of Egypt because he happens to be, yeah, he's an authoritarian, but for the average Egyptian, it's probably a better life than what it was under that democracy that produced the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, It's important for the United States to have, you know, allies, certainly in the Middle East and other regions of the world, and so I think to sort of put governments and leaders into good, bad, black, white, you know, is something that's, it's probably too extreme to say that's something the media does, but, but there is sort of, you know, 
less nuance in the reporting than I think there needs to be. It's an easy way. It's an easy way to, it's an easy way, I guess, to analyze complicated situations. Uh, but I think the other thing I'm troubled by is the, again, the, 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 the articles that purport to be news, straight news, that are imbued with opinions and analysis and assume, when I'm reading them, I feel like they don't trust me to make my own decisions about what's going on or what's being reported. But read a variety of sources, and I, and I like the, what you said exactly, read independent journalists and, and see what they're saying. And read beyond, uh, read, read newspapers and out of Europe and the UK. Read what they're saying. What are they saying about the United States? Um, again, I think that's the antidote to, you know, the closest thing we have is an antidote to what I consider to be biased reporting in the United States. Uh, I think one of the, the, the biggest and most critical issues in the coming decades will be the proliferation of cheap technology. Um, the barriers are lo lowered for anyone wanting to uh, commit violence, to, uh, to develop a very sophisticated warfare capability because of technology. Um, not only, you know, drones are cheap, uh, autonomous drones um, that can, you know, do military damage or collect intelligence. Uh, the barrier to entry is very cheap. You do not have to be a superpower anymore to have a fairly sophisticated military capability. Um, and with the advent of AI, I mean, all bets are off on where that's going to lead. Um, and of course, you know, the cliche is we'll, we'll find ourselves in a, a, you know, a nuclear war without a human intervening. I think that's everybody's nightmare. Um, I also am... Beyond the, the, the threat of technology um, and, and warfare and its impact on warfare, um, I'm also concerned about, again, what started out as a wonderful thing, the Internet and the proliferation of education and information, which has, you know, devolved into a tool. It's still a wonderful source of information and, and opportunity for people to educate themselves uh, at, without having to spend, you know, hundreds of dollars to go to fancy universities and colleges and schools. Um, the, you know, the proliferation of, uh, of false information, of biased information, of, of, you know, really pretty acrid reporting and, and and I think, again, the, the way the internet works, everybody knows this, is that it curates what you see. So it reinforces whatever beliefs you might have and doesn't challenge them and doesn't force you to think. Um, and I do think that's somewhat at the root of the divisiveness, not only in the United States, but around the world. You know, the... Um, was the peace di dividend of the 1990s uh, meant that... Uh, that a lot of the intelligence and national security infrastructure in the United States was, you know, not, not necessarily dismantled, but uh, workforces went down, and there was a perception that intelligence and national security capabilities were no longer necessary because we had entered a new era of peace and harmony on Earth. And I think, you know, we've all discovered now that was short-sighted, but but I don't think that's I don't think that's unusual. I mean, after the Vietnam War, there was the same tendency, and it wasn't until Ronald Reagan came to office that he came in on a pledge to rebuild uh, our military and the the intelligence capability, and and did so. Um, and and so I think you know at post 9/11, of course, you know we woke up and and realized that intelligence, the need for intelligence, has not gone away. In the 1990s, um, Daniel Patrick Moynihan twice introduced bills to uh, 
abolish the CIA and divide up its parts into State Department and the Department of Defense. And uh, that did not pass. Um, but um, I think now, um, post 9-11, of course, there was a huge hiring spree, uh, both into the federal government, but also, you know, the, um, the sort of enormous growth of contractors in, within the government, uh, which some people have a, a gut reaction that's bad. Um, that's not mine. I think um, contractors, there's a, there's a role for contractors within government because anyone who's ever been in government or administered a government agency understands that when you hire a government worker, you've hired them for life, even post-retirement, you know, post because you're paying their pension and they're you know, subsidizing their, their medical care and other things for life. So contractors in a time of surge requirements um, work out pretty well because you can bring people in quickly and you don't own them. The companies that bring them in own them. So uh, that's one of the things that came out of 9-11 of was a larger number of contractors in the uh, national security um, government space. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was a huge... There was the, I forget what they called it, the, the double hump within the intelligence community in the 1990s, where um, 1990s they quit hiring as many people. And so you had a lot of, you know, older employees, a lot of them. You, in the 1990s, you didn't have that many experienced and mid-level employees, and yet you had this huge bump of new, young less experienced employees. So it, it creates a workforce dynamic that's not ideal uh, if you're missing sort of those GS-13s and GS-14s who, who know what they're doing and aren't as expensive as these, these, these you know, older, more senior folks who are getting ready to retire. Um, so those kinds of surges and then drop-offs aren't healthy for, a, for an organization. Um, I think we learned a lot in 9-11. One of the things that I think came about, of course, the advent of the um, Director of National Intelligence, the DNI, um, which is uh, 20 years old uh, this year. Uh, December 2004 was the IRTPA, Intelligence Reform and Terrorist Prevention Act, which was adopted in 2004, which created the Director of National Intelligence. And you know, the driving force behind that were the findings of the 9-11 Commission, which, um, which advocated for, you know, something to, you know, avoid the failure to connect the dots. That was what everybody was saying post 9-11, that they had this information, it was buried in little pockets around the government, and it never got brought together in a way that you could, um, <clears throat> you could, you know, complete the circle and say, oh, this attack is going to happen, these guys are going to do it, it's going to be on 9-11, and they're going to fly airplanes into buildings. Uh, we didn't bring that together. So the creation of the DNI and the National Counterterrorism Center, uh, the impetus behind that was to give us a, a structure that would enable us to collaborate and cooperate more closely. And... Um, and I think in some ways it worked, in other ways it produced a huge new bureaucracy and another layer. Um, so I think the jury's out. I think it was mostly a good thing. I think one of the things that helped intelligence enormously during the uh, the two thousands and the you know the the teens uh, was the um, the the conduct of the intelligence community in the war zones, where you had, unlike Washington, where you have the stovepipes of the different organizations, uh, D Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, the, um, you know, the FBI, the CIA. Well, in the war zones, uh, in, in Afghanistan and Iraq, you had all those agencies basically working together in, in the U.S. Embassy. They're, you know, all in a position where, where it's not a matter of conducting a meeting across town. It's, you're all sitting together making decisions together. And I think that was 
really good for interoperability and sharing of information across the government. Um, it it'll, remains to be seen with the drawdown of our presence in Afghanistan and Iraq whether you know some of that will be lost. Um, that was one of the, you know, you might say few good outcomes from the, the Iraq and the Afghan wars. Uh, well, it's a it's a think tank, but we um, basically the 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 goal is education to educate the public, to educate the policymakers, and influence uh, not to influence but to educate. So uh, our policymakers are able to make decisions and and make policy based on information and analysis. And, um, and finally, uh, the next generation. Uh, FPRI has a very robust internship program and, um, and to encourage young folks to get involved and interested in international affairs and public service. Um, one of my great concerns uh, when I was teaching at Georgetown uh, in the or 2017, 2018, is many of my students no longer wanted to go into government. And I'm deeply concerned for the country when the best and brightest no longer want to go into public service. I think it's the strength of our nation that people want to stand up and serve.